Thank you. This carpet feels really great on bare feet, by the way. Maybe some of you future presenters might want to give it a shot. <laughs> Admit it, you're losing touch. Touch with touch. Think about it. When was the last time you touched someone? Was it conscious? What did it feel like? What about, when was the last time you touched a device, like a laptop or a mobile phone? How about a little experiment? Raise you whatever you're holding right now. How many of you are holding humans? How many are holding phones? <laughs> <laughs> I see mostly technology out there. Now, another little thing to do, take the first two fingers of your right hand and place them directly beside your throat. This is your pulse. Mine's running a little high right now. This puts you in touch with your physiology immediately. If you remove your fingers, you're still alive, yeah? But you're out of tune now. You're not in touch with yourself. It's the same thing between people. We lose touch with each other when we lose touch. Don and I think that as we lose touch, we are disempowering ourselves as a society and as individuals. And in fact, humans can't collaborate, innovate, or create to the same degree without it. Now, we're not saying, you know, hack away your devices. We're saying... You know, hold your devices, but pick up your kids too. Touch them. And we're going to show you all about it. Touch. <laughs> no, we're doing this one. <laughs> we just like touching oh, yeah, it. doesn't really yeah, matter yeah. what you do. We had a brain first. So, Don, i got to tell you, something was a little wrong there. I heard you had a few last week. It's not working for me. I had a couple days of work to do. And if I don't get my work done, seriously, the whole thing's going down. So, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I hate it when you get your sweat on me. Really. <laughs> it just really gets me. Seriously, dude, get over it. Um, I was thinking about safety glasses, but... Uh, wait, wait, wait. Waiver? Did you oh, have a waiver? Oh, darn. Yeah, don't drop me, dude, because okay. if you do, I'm okay, we'll do this. we'll do this the right way this time. All right. Okay. Ready? All right. Careful. Much better. Oh, I feel safe. Oh, bitch. <laughs> Ooh, that's hot. So, John and I have found really, um, really interesting things while we've done acro yoga. You learn so much in an instant of touch that you would never in hours, minutes of conversation. And the thing is, is that acro yoga is a little different than regular yoga. In regular yoga, I grab my mat, I roll it out, you grab your mat, we're all in our own geography, don't come near my space. Acrobatic yoga, we're in touch with each other, we're engaged, we're totally in tune. And one thing that you find when you're in acro yoga is you really notice when people change. And people do change when you have them balanced precariously on your feet. Um, <laughs> <They're locked. laughs> sometimes they'll, uh, you know, they could feel warm or cold before and they'll totally change. Maybe they might change based on the amount of caffeine, caffeine they had. But you learn so many interesting, tiny little things in acro yoga. That's true. And some of my best friends are acrobatic yoga partners. Before I started doing acrobatic yoga, I had an idea of friendship, and then I started doing acrobatic yoga, and it deepened my understanding of friendship. And as a yoga teacher, I can't imagine not being able to touch a student in order to teach them and help them. It doesn't make sense. And as a software engineer, I find that acro yoga, <laughs> I don't do it while I code, let me tell you that. No kidding! <laughs> However, I find that it is a great reprieve from the logic and the structure that is software. When you're with another human being, everything is reactive. Humans in flight don't act the same as when their two feet are on the ground. Sure. And so touch is everywhere. One of the great minds of our time, Derrida, went as far as to say that sense is touch and touch is sense. Touch is primary because it's active. The other senses tend to be a lot more passive and not as powerful. And we, I, I find that now, after... Uh, developing the sense, we have completely disconnected from it. Um, in fact, uh, we have, uh, it's become a vestige of our, our biological and evolutionary past. So, 
in terms of sight, one of the things, is that right? One of the things? Yeah. So sight as a sense is still arguably a touch sense. So light comes into my eyes, rocks around in my corneas and my rods, and then comes into my brain and bang, I've got some touch going on, I have images. That's another interesting thing. You think about all of our other senses, and they're really based fundamentally on touch itself. Take, for example, our sense of hearing. Sound comes, hits our eardrum, bounces off those little tiny ear bones, all having some contact there, and then finally, some small hairs, not unlike those on our own skin, uh, pick up that sensation via contact and send those signals onto the brain. Same thing, nose and mouth. It's those molecules coming in contact with specialized receptors. We're wired for touch. Plants, okay, seriously. Research is showing that plants engage in touch. They, they need touch to grow, and they respond up and against gravity as a touch. It's crazy. And also, researchers at UC Santa Barbara recently discovered that simple organisms like bacteria even use touch, surprisingly enough. And they use it to communicate. Without that communication, these bacteria can't even live. Children. Oh, children. Oh, yeah, in the womb. It's crazy. It's the first sense developed in the womb. Three weeks after conception, your nervous system, which is very primitive at that point, is linking the skin cells with your rudimentary brain. So we're wired from the get-go, first one, within three weeks. And also animals, throughout the animal kingdom, <laughs> all use touch. Darwin told this, this great story about two old chimpanzees who were introduced to together for the first time. They introduced each other by protruding their lips and giving each other a big kiss. <laughs> then one put the arm around the other, they embraced, they both stood up, put their heads to the sky and yelled with delight. You! Just like they'd never met. But, oh, it's touch extinct. So, for this one, zoologist Desmond Morris talks about human beings as being these incredible units. We are the end point of billions of years of evolutionary intelligence. And what happens is we have subtle refinements and amazing adjustments that have occurred. So on that, we are the most amazing organism on the planet. And yet, as a result of this, this evolution, we've sort of backtracked. And it's been a vestige recently with modern advancements in technology. We don't really need it anymore. It's sort of abruptly... Uh, amputated from modern life. Hmm. Lost me, Dave. <laughs> ah, in the old days. Don't you start the old days? I think I think we should break out into some more accurate. Oh, is that the time? I'm feeling like <laughs> a little bit like no touch is happening here. I am um, touch starved. So we're gonna try to do a little bit of acting, like. Mm -hmm. I'm texting, man. Texting, texting, texting. I can texting. text and do almost anything. <laughs> Things have changed. Most of us know that when we're not getting any touch, something's <laughs> wrong. When when we're mad at somebody, when we're frustrated, with when something when you're something's going on between two people, the first thing to go is that touch. And this happens not only in like an individual case, but also in society. Think back to India's untouchables. There was an entire group of people that it was not okay to touch. We know from this that when there's no touch, something is terribly wrong. So social health could be measured by how much touch is going on, and the lack of touch could be viewed as some sort of dis-ease. Um, now we have whole societies of people who don't touch. We'll go days and days without touching anyone. It's insane. Some of the most famous characters in history are renowned for their going out of their way to touch. Take Jesus for an example. He was not afraid to touch the outcast, the dying. And if he had worn these rubber gloves, do you think his message would have been lost? I'm thinking. <laughs> Speaking of Jesus, um, <laughs> let's let's go through the ten do not touch commandments. Ten. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Ten. Number one, don't touch people of the opposite gender. Seriously. It's a sexual overture. I know you're thinking we're sleeping together. I know it. <laughs> Number two. Do not touch someone of the same gender. 
Ooh, homophobia, homosexuality. Did someone say wow? <laughs> Number three. That was a little low. <laughs> Number three, don't touch yourself. That sounds dirty. I don't know it why. It really does. <laughs> Number four, don't touch strangers. Stranger danger. They're no phobia. They're not new friends. They're people you don't know. Number five, do not touch the elderly, the sick, or the dying. Get the gloves, and that's dangerous. Number six, do not touch people of different status. They think you're trying to mug them, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, don't touch someone if without a lawyer present. Sign off on that waiver, seriously, you can be sued. What about number eight? <laughs> don't touch clients, coworkers. Ooh, I'm not even no, sure I'm not even sure. appropriate. <laughs> number nine, don't touch children. Uh, even in the school system, you never know. Legislation, regulation. And number ten. What was number ten? Certain specifics. Yeah, there's always for certain specific places and times for touch. Right, I don't touch people when I'm on white up. It just doesn't happen. I have these rules and I don't break them. <laughs> One of the coolest things about touch is that it inspires touch. Trust. Are we doing acro now? We can do some acro. Yeah, let's do it. Trust. <laughs> this requires a lot of trust. The beautiful thing about touch is that it inspires trust. When we touch each other, we are in a cycle of trusting and growing and continuing with that, and we're wired for it, so it's not like it's outside of our reality. Come back to one of the one of the interesting things about touch is that it's inherently reciprocal. Mm -hmm. When when you use one of your other senses, like smell or hearing, it's a one way street. However, if I brush someone else's skin, both of us are attuned to the same interaction. And technology tries to emulate this, except technology doesn't have the two ways. So it's fast, but Technology won't help me understand the subtle nuances of how Stephen's feeling right now because I can feel it, I can sense it. That's part of the way I'm wired biologically and physiologically. And the synchronicity of touch mimics the synchronicity of communication. When I'm having a conversation, there's a synchronized flow that's happening between us. And technology isn't particularly good at following this, this mechanism. Sometimes it overwhelms us. Sometimes it overwhelms our capacity with its insensitive information. Indeed. And now, in the world we live in, touch is a choice. I have to go outside of my safe zone to touch somebody because in day-to-day -day life, it's not something that's going to come my way. It's not going to happen between us unless I enact it. Yeah. And going back to the trust point, touch is integrally related to trust. Like, I can't think of a lot of things that give that oxytocin um, experience so that when I give a hug, we know that re researchers have found that there's oxytocin released into our bloodstream, and that gives us sort of a shared blue experience that binds us together. And if that happens, there, I mean, that, that's, there's not a lot of other places where that happens, aside from a bottle of wine, <laughs> mind you. But because touch primes us for trust, there's also sort of a sad irony that in order to touch, we also need trust. So we found ourselves in sort of a catch-22 situation where we're not willing to trust, we're, tr we're not willing to touch because we can't trust too many people. And we're also... Uh, we're not touching, not touching, trusting, so we're trusting. in a vicious cycle. So one of the greatest things about touch, beyond all others, is just the joy that it brings. Most of us, deep down, 
yearn to touch. Some of us deeper than others. <laughs> we need it. Um, when we when we hug with each other, oh, yeah. when we wrestle yeah. as a family, it builds intimacy right. in those relationships. In fact, for most of us, some of our deep relationships, it's hard to imagine those existing without that sense of touch. And so we are spiritually moved and enlightened, and we require and we receive intimacy from touch. Uh, touch turns us on. It makes us laugh. It gives us all kinds of energy, oxytocin-wise. Um, oh, is an email ever intimate? Technology tries so hard to be human. <laughs> Technology has changed our, our lives in nearly every possible way, aside from the most human and biological ways. How about iPod Touch? Well, Apple created an entire brand out of our sense, but does it deserve the moniker? I don't know. Interact machine. Unless you're being mugged, there's not really a whole lot of interaction. <laughs> Microsoft Connect. So Microsoft has had incredible success doing something interesting, taking the tactility away from even our video gaming. And cloud. Most of us know somewhere out there in the ether is just all our information. Amazon, one of the bigger cloud companies, stores over 905 billion objects representing something tangible in this world. Users access it over a over, over race of about 650,000 per second. That's wild. Now imagine taking all that interaction and bringing it face to face, touch to touch, the way it used to be. So technology isn't the bad guy, but in order to touch, we need a certain amount of vulnerability and reliance. And some of us just aren't willing to go there. Mm. Where to start? Um. Biologically? Ah, yes. Yeah. Go for it. Biologically, we're wired for this. It's been proven from three weeks on, animals, everybody, uh, plants, it's something that we re require to continue and to thrive and grow. And yet, we don't do it. <laughs> so, we, there's, some, there's these ten commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, just ringing in our heads. And we know that because we're not doing it, there's something wrong. And the global issues in the 21st century require us to more than ever across the globe come together, solve our problems, be co-creative, communicate deeply. This isn't like this anymore in order to solve those issues. We need to critically look at the kind of relationships we want moving into the future. If we have families that are just texting and emailing each other, you're not going to have the sort of depth of relationship. But if you take any group of people and you know... And, and you see them touching and embracing touch, you know that that group is willing to collaborate, they trust each other, and they're going to go places. So we're here to say making the choice to touch can make all the difference in the world. Let's do play. Let's do one more. Yeah. <laughs> 